Sorry, I'm in my hotel room, but that's where I'm at. <laughs> I have I have done many podcasts and YouTube things on in from hotel rooms, myself included. Gotcha. So, <laughs> How are you, man? Nobody cares. Right. That's true. <laughs> and, it, and it's it's appropriate. You're having a world premiere. I mean, uh, in in a matter of hours, and uh, that's good. I know. I wish you could be there. Me too. So yeah. you're in, you're not in Red Hook. Are you in Livingston or Chatham? Where are you? Yeah, right in the, squeezed in the middle of that little sandwich there. <laughs> yeah. You, I'm, seen... uh, no, south of there, south of, uh, I'm in uh, uh, Claremont, which is. Claremont, of course, yeah. You know, just north, literally over the border of Columbia County. Yeah, yeah, and right all the in, apples there. And near Tivoli, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a minute from Tivoli's next door. Yeah. Just due uh, west of me. And uh, so, yeah. And um, yeah, it's just so beautiful here. It's fantastic. I just really happy. yeah, I can imagine, especially this time of year. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I've been finding it's all, all year. I mean, but this morning I was driving. There was a, like the uh, it was like early. I, I and <clears throat> there was um a little bit of a fog, you know, a little mist going on, and the light and the sun hit the like you know just the roads and the and the. And the pastures and the barns and and it was just like just unbelievably beautiful light and wow. I mean you could have shot, you know, the perfect movie. On that. Just right now, I can imagine. You know, I grew up there, so it was always hard yeah. to appreciate when I was living there. I just wanted to get out. Well, well, I know I that. <laughs> well, that's another thing I said to the person I was with. I was like, you know, when you're who, who actually one of the things he does is drives a school bus, and he and he's like, you know, uh, th- he says that's the one of the really perks of just in the morning he's up early you know obviously and, he, and he's driving on these roads and it's so beautiful and he he just gets very moved by that and i said yeah if it weren't for those little screaming brats in the back of it you right know. but uh, <laughs> they don't have any appreciation of course at that age for that they're much they have much many other you don't know anything else yeah exactly um but that's wild so yeah when i was l- l- kind of looking up to communicate with you uh, i saw that you were said Red Hook, I was like, I didn't know Tom was from Red Hook. I didn't, I just didn't know. Yeah. Um, and uh, what was the other thing that, that had come? Oh yeah, so I was also reminded that you and I did, a, did my podcast, probably I'm gonna guess maybe about five years ago with Davi's Way. Oh, right, in, in the Hamptons. Yeah, exactly. I think we were live together, right? In East Hampton, yeah. yeah. We were in the back in the garden of uh, right uh, at a table with Robert and uh, it was you. like the press area and everyone was doing press. Yeah, right. I forgot right. who our PR was. Was it Marion? I don't remember. Well, Frank. It wasn't Frank. Betsy. Frank PR. Frank. Well, okay. I mean, they handle the, the the festival, so I, I just I don't know. Maybe your film had a different publicist, but of your own, right? But it might have. I, I, we might have gone with Frank PR though for that festival. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, it would make sense to, if, I don't know if you would save money doing that because they were handling the festival and they do all of, uh, they do everything there. They're set Yeah, up. it was probably Frank. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm hoping that viewers of this podcast now will uh, appreciate this public, publicist information, but uh, well, <laughs> you, I will only conclude by saying Betsy's great and a um, good choice there. She's fantastic. Yeah, I've worked with her on Guest of Cindy Sherman, if you've ever seen that film. Like I that. did. As a matter of fact, I think that's, a, I think actually that's the first time I met you. Because yeah. was that, that 2012 sense. or something? No, 2009. Oh, and then and it couldn't have been. Casting by would have been 12. So that's. Oh, wait. No, no. Let me think. No, no. That was way too young. Too, too, too young. Too, too many years ago. Yeah, you were way uh, too young. We were, yeah, we were little, little Tom and little Adam at the time. <laughs> we're. Just like same heads, just little bodies. Where we so no, it had to be out maybe casting by. Yeah, that, that could be it. It might have been casting by. Yeah. Did you have film wax then? Yeah, in 2011. It's my 10th year anniversary of uh, yeah. So you would have done casting by, I think. That's cool. I, I may have yeah, no, I mean I remember it coming up in our conversation. Actually, I just listened to it again because I was I was like, I think. You know, it also kind of becomes a blur, but I, I said, I distinctly, rem- I remember 
when I knew when once I was reminded that Davi's Way was one of your projects that I definitely remember. Then I said, oh, absolutely, yeah. Tom's been on. And I just looked it up and it had been in kind of, um, you know, uh, not at, at live on the podcast anymore, you know, because it's kind of an older episode now. But I re I, I just put it back up for this for the heck of it. Um, well, you know, it's funny because this project comes out of Davi's Way. I'm not surprised by that. I see it. I, I, yeah. I, there's a, obviously a very strong connection there in terms of crooners, you know, and go ahead. Well, it, it, that's where I met Dina. So Dina Martin, Dean's oh. daughter, performing <laughs> in the third act. If you remember Davi's way, Robert tries to put on this big oh, Frank's 100th birthday celebration and ends up at the Avalon and Hollywood and Vine and things don't go that well. But right. Dina was so nice to volunteer to sing a couple of songs with Robert, you know, solo in a duet. And, uh, and so we met and she saw casting by and loved it and said, would you consider doing a doc on my dad? This was wow. 2015. And uh, I said, yeah, I would love to. And uh, that's kind of where it started. And then we just started piggybacking interviews for that on other yeah. films. This changes everything. All these other films, Bob Newhart, Florence Henderson, before she passed away, Regis Philbin. Right. And before that's we even funny. like, we're trying to go out there and sell it. We were right. just kind of getting the interviews and, and Angie Dickinson and right. uh, the film kind of, slowly formed over the years yeah yeah oh yeah right right and angie is alive right angie's still alive yeah 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 um, she's amazing yeah. angie angie dickinson forever <laughs> she's incredible that woman what was her name pepper what was her Who, for a while you mean as a police woman. woman yeah oh i don't know i never actually the show was too adult for me growing up that right. was so she was she was the first female lead in a dramatic series, 1974. I almost put that in This Changes Everything to tell that story, but it was too much. Right. Oh, yeah. Which was your... And she was in her 50s very... by then. Wow. And so she was a female lead in her 50s, you know, first female lead in her 50s. That's incredible. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it was a contemporary, but she's you won't see her in anything. It's Jenna Rollins, too, you know, but... but um... She was also started kind of as a Hollywood ingenue, but then met that that dark, mysterious man and General yeah. Rollins I'm talking about. And anyway, so no, uh, no. not not Angie. Right. Um, uh, no, you have some terrific uh, terrific cast members. Let's call them there uh, in your in the movie. It's really just uh, and and some people that were you know you wouldn't necessarily typically. <laughs> or expect to be in there that were real big fans of Dean Martin, right? Which is, oh, yeah, yeah. we're talking about, Dean yeah, Martin, you might Dean expect Martin. Alec Baldwin who's in it, but you wouldn't expect Riza, I think, Un unless you knew that Riza, you know, the founder of the Wu Tang clan, also spent some of his time growing up in Steubenville, Ohio, where, where Dean Martin was from. So that was the connection. We just reached out to his management and they said he'd love to do it. Right. And he turned out to be, I think, the Yoda of the film. He's so wise, so <laughs> incredible. Right. Yeah, the, right. And and interesting, I mean, you think about the Wu Tang Clan, and the and it could be a much more updated version of the Rat Pack. I mean, they kind of th this idea of just sort of, you know, it, it, the boys' club, you know, and and being so tight and creating so much incredible stuff together, you know. Well, because it's a combination, I think, of their style and their music, and that's what Wu Tang Clan is, and that's what that's what the Rat Pack was. And you know, RZA says in the film. Jay Z and his guy—it's like they all—they all come out of this lineage of the Rat Pack, and it may even go earlier than the Rat Pack. But that was really the first time I think that you, we were confronting the idea of this sense of masculinity in the '60s coming out of World War II. So men, you know, in World War II, men were brothers, band of brothers, and they were together. And suddenly, then in the '50s, they end up in their homes in these isolated suburbs with their families, and that sense of brotherhood that you had in World War II was gone. And I think Martin and Lewis, Dean and Jerry coming together was kind of a, a spoof, a satire, a celebration of that sense of brotherhood and, and almost a fantasy version of that sense of masculinity and brotherhood that, that had been lost by these men fighting World War II. And I think at the time of JFK in the early 60s, he, JFK was a great, he was trying to reclaim that sense of masculine brotherhood. And that's, that's why I think he the, the Rat Pack really appealed to him too in his campaign and why the Rat, Rat Pack was so successful in helping get him elected because there was this sense of this lost masculinity that JFK was supposed to be reclaiming. Well, so you think that's probably where that started. And I mean, you know, you, the documentary is called D. Martin, King of Cool, right? Yeah. 
just king of cool, right? So, and I think we you kind of explained some of the explanation behind the subtitle, <laughs> like yeah. about about this what was kind of what was cool at the time. This, you know, um, well, is it what is cool at the time, or is that kind of what cool American cool is, right? Like my my story producer, the brilliant Ron Morosco, he breaks it down into its components and kind of, we kind of thread those components throughout the film to say, this is why Dean had every element of cool. This is what makes him the king of cool. And then was able, then personified it. So, right, I mean. So perfectly, yeah. And yet at the same time, in a way that cool was a certain surface that was covering well, yeah. a lot and that, of other things. Yeah, exactly. So we move from the subtitle to the title, which is Dean Martin. It's a great um, point, yeah. Yeah, and you know where we get into get to see this sort of person who had quite the who was kind of quite complex, because you know he put off this the cool part of him is in direct conflict with the darker side of him, and, and in a way I think the Italian side of him, right, that sense of family and that sense of belonging and that raucous sense of community that he had growing up was very different than cool. Yeah. So when, when he leaves that sense of family and community growing up, he kind of goes inside himself, I think, and tries to rebuild that throughout his life. And that that's one of the big themes in the film. Well, yeah. And it also seems like he really kind of kept to himself. He distanced himself. Like, in other words, he was there for the party, but he also would sneak off into the, his room. Well, it was the, the Andy Griffith moment show. where sneak off to see the Andy Griffith show. Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and you have a, a great moment with um, uh, the filmmaker uh, Henry Javelin, <laughs> uh, right? Henry, who who's done the show a couple of times actually. But he, oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Very irascible. You noticed, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, managed to get on his good side. I don't know, but good, good. Yeah, but I, 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 there's a, there's actually. Remind me, uh, you know Jeremy Workman, right? You probably know Jeremy. Very, I know him very well. Has he, yeah. done your, he, he did uh, my trailer. For of course he did. Does, <laughs> did he ever tell you the, his Henry Jaglin stories? He probably did. I knew there was a connection. Okay. Oh, yeah, he did. Did he do a documentary on Henry? Yes, yes. he did. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's got a couple of really good J Henry Jaglum stories. But uh, sure. Henry Jaglum, young, very young man at the time, he's uh, invited to this party at Dean Martin's house. And, and, um, you know, uh, goes up to use the washroom, I guess, right? Well, just so you know, he's dating Natalie Wood. That's the, you buried the headline there. <laughs> wait, wait, who, who uh, uh, J Henry Jaglum was? Henry was was dating Natalie Wood at the time. And Natalie, of course, oh. was very well connected with that part of Hollywood. So she right. invited oh. him along. I Little see. detail. Right. Thank you for that. Um, but, you know, so so he runs into, D, you know, Dean Martin, who's like watching Andy Griffith's show in his bedroom, escaping from uncomfortable uh, this uncomfortable so he's good with the charade but he's i mean this isn't so unusual with a lot of people that are famous or certainly comedians and people but yeah so you see very quickly that this is a performance this cool thing as was the drunk for, yeah for the most part these are all ways to kind of ultimately distance himself from actually really connecting to people yeah including the wives and right. family, yeah. yeah Even though Dina, would, Dina would argue, you know, yeah. Dina pushes back on the idea that we hardly knew him. His family hardly knew him. She felt like she knew him, like he would loved her, and he was very intimate and very wonderful with his family. But that's not the way other people knew him. Like I know when I interviewed Angie Dickinson, I did the whole interview with her. I think forty five minutes, and then I, I rode her home in an Uber to her her house in the hills, and she grabbed my hand and said, Tom, I've known this man for decades, and yet I felt like I never knew him. Right, yeah. Everyone says the same thing. I just had uh, dinner with Lainey Kazan. Same exact thing. You know, everyone says the same thing. Um, and so it kind of, it's interesting. It does provoke, then, this idea, like, what, you know, because uh, uh, one baby step backward, he, he was a very a present father. Uh, I know he you know, left wives who had children that he had children with. Yeah, yeah. And that, but he, he did manage to figure out, because he just happened to have very agreeable ex-wives, apparently, yeah, yeah. to figure out how to incorporate 
and keep relationships with his children. So, you know, it's interesting. So th th it wasn't for a lack of love. There was just something blocking him to be able to allow himself to be vulnerable enough. It, this is me playing, you know. No, I think you're, I think this is brilliant, Adam. I think that's exactly right. But I mean, but the love was clearly there. And of course, you see it in its most extreme when he loses his son. Yeah. And then he's destroyed. And even before he loses his son, he loses his mom, his brother, his father. Well, right. Well, good point. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. loss. And he so there's all this grief. Well. And it goes back to the masculinity thing of that era, which is they don't know how to deal with that grief. Right. And they already are closed up. So what are you right. doing? How is that? You know, Riza says in the film, there's that blade of grass that gets through the concrete and you can't stop that blade of grass from growing to the concrete. And that gra that's going to come out no matter what. And, you know, Riza said it was his inner child and nothing, no concrete, nothing could stop that inner child from coming out and kind of ultimately mm. messing up those last years of his life. Mm. It's a really good film, and I like the time. I'm glad Thank the you, time. Man. I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't know if it was planned or not, but you know, the timing seems to be just really good right now. Um, no, I mean, it's not. It's hard to plan these things, but you're right. It's good. Yeah. It's, the zeitgeist is ready, I think, for a film like this. And yeah, I had made just changes everything kind of at the right time. That zeitgeist, but now I think that film would have been way late if it came out now. You know, right? And I would say, you know, for people, if you enjoy this document or if you've already seen sam pollard's documentary on sammy davis jr this is a lovely companion or works really well together because you get to see these two guys who are loved each other um and i, I you know one thing I, I brought up the sammy uh davis because of course they were in the rat pack together but that i re distinctly remember jfk the jfk white house i doubt jfk himself shunned sammy davis yeah. For the inaugura inauguration party, the inaugural bow the inaugur gala or whatever. Mm -hmm. They, you know, Sammy Davis couldn't get it. He wasn't invited. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I make any, you know. No, that's exactly or, right. And, and the cool thing is, you know, he was know, very well, upset about it. He was very right. upset about it because he was big. He was there like the other guys in the Rat Pack supporting Kennedy. And he was really disrespected. And then so people, you know, you get, you get a lot of flack when Nixon invited him to the White House. But hey, Nixon invited Sammy Davis Jr. into the White House. Now, you can argue, OK, Nixon was using Sammy Davis Jr. too and maybe didn't expect the kisses and hugs that Sammy laid on him. Yeah, no, but you're right. He's using him, but it's still symbolically important and, has, yeah. and carries weight. Yeah. Um, and, but to get back to Dean, you know, he didn't go. Am, am I right? Or he, he Dean did not go. go because Sammy was not invited. So Dean said that he's my friend. I'm not going. You know, yeah, so I, a real honor code that Dean had. That's enormous to me. I think yeah. it really says a lot about his character. So here he is able to, he's a very complex guy because <laughs> he's able to do things like that. He's not shallow. Uh, the, the, you know, distancing that we've talked about is nothing is does it, it doesn't equate with some level of shallow he's there as a friend he's there as you know he was just unable to very loyal to his friends and, and, and i believe he probably went through a, a lot of inner turmoil and angst over his failed marriages i'm guessing but because he wasn't able to ultimately be present for them emotionally or connectively that right. and they needed more from him you know, and, yeah, and uh, I think when he left his second wife, uh, I think he didn't understand the import of that when he did it, because like you said, he's so distant. Right. He didn't understand the emotional ramifications until after. So the next marriage, the third marriage, only lasted a few years, and he ended up going back to Jeannie, he the did. second marriage, really the love of his life, sure. uh, until he died, until he died. They never lived together again, but they spent about 15 years having dinner together almost every night. Wow. It's touching and, and a little sad. Yeah. At the end is definitely sad. Ben Mankiewicz at TCM, when he interviewed me, he said, Tom, I only, I only cried for the last 25 minutes of the movie. <laughs> I did. I did cry. I did. I did get, I get, I got yeah. emotional. I can't remember the exact moment, but I definitely teared up. Oh, I do remember. Even though I've seen it a hundred times on YouTube, <laughs> it's what the reunion, you know, Jerry oh, Lewis, God. again, uh, you know, here was, it was took Dean Martin. Once again, the, was the one who, 
made reached out and extended the olive branch, you know, to, to well, it's Frank it. ultimately. I think it, there's four times in the film where Frank Sinatra does a solid for Dean, and each time it's very important in Dean's career, you know, at least three of those four times. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first was when he went up on stage with Martin and Lewis and said, these guys are going to be huge. And oh, Frank right. Sinatra was the biggest star in the world at that time. And his his endorsement was really, really important. And then when Dean broke up with Jerry, he basically said. Uh, yeah, he, took, he was hit a low in his career and then he took him on to. Uh, back so Dean didn't know what was going to happen in nightclubs because he was used to being part of Martin and Lewis. Right. So ultimately, you know, D, uh, Frank had him booked at the Sands to do a solo performance. And that's where Dean realized I need to do something different and new. And he came up with Norman Lear's writing partner for Colgate Comedy Hour, the idea of the drunk act, the Joey Lewis drunk act, that Joey Lewis was no longer around. And Dean took over the drunk act, <laughs> drinking apple juice instead of whiskey, but brilliantly acting drunk for the rest of his career. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then the third time was the reunion with Jerry Lewis. Reunion, right. Right. The fourth um, time, 1988, trying to get Dean out from grieving about the loss of his son. The reunion. To do the Together Again tour, the right. reunion in Vegas, and, and ultimately that failed. Dean didn't want to do that. And the two had a bit of a falling out over that, but just a bit of one. Um, it's called Dean Martin, King of Cool, and it's having its world premiere at Doc NYC. Um, is Sunday sold out yet? Or there it's sold out, yeah. And there's actually a new there's a new screening added Monday at four. Right, I saw that at the uh, IFC Center. At the IFC Center, yeah. The 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 sold out one is going to be at the SVA. Um, there's still, I mean, you can get rushed there, when I try to make it. And I guess it also through there. Of course, is uh, uh, there was a uh, a a, a uh, TV movie of of the right of the about the Rat Pack some years ago, Leonardo DiCaprio. HBO, right? On Joe Montaigne. I interviewed Joe Montaigne actually and for Davi's way, but he did a little Dean in the film. film. Hmm? He didn't make it into the film. No, I didn't interview him for Dean Martin. I interviewed him for uh, Davi's way. It was Robert oh, and, and okay. Joe in a scene together, and Joe talked about playing Dean and did okay. a little imitation. I tried to get it to work, but it didn't. It didn't work in this film. Well. Leonardo DiCaprio is an executive producer, so that's pretty amazing. Italian American, and, uh, yeah, and, and uh, Martin Scorsese was close to being an EP as well, but couldn't ultimately couldn't watch the film in time before I had to lock it. Oh, that's 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 yeah. That's, it, it seems I would say I mean, he just but really, I mean, it doesn't seem to. You see, you just have all, so many amazing people. I know, but I think uh, Scorsese would have been amazing in the film, but he was he was out in Oklahoma shooting his film, Killers of the Flower Moon, so it was. Really I'm impossible even to, to go on movie. Hmm? <laughs> it was nice of you to still plug his movie. And <laughs> he, he could use the help, it turns out, right? I know that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's gonna be at Doc MYC. And then uh so if you're in New York City and then on Sunday, uh there you're gonna have a pretty amazing uh QA. You'll be there. Laney, who you mentioned, who's uh new dean very well, um uh and on the yeah. surface, <laughs> uh she'll be there. <laughs> and to say that she didn't know him that well because he wouldn't let her. Yeah, because um, nobody did. And uh, anybody else at that uh, is coming in? Uh, Bill Boggs is moderating. Bill Boggs, okay. Yeah, I've I don't know if you know him. Times. Like I grew up with Bill Boggs. Me too. Fact, I knew Bill Boggs is having interviewed Frank Sinatra. So oh yeah. W. I said, uh, I, me and Frank, so that's great. Yeah. What was it? <laughs> uh, Fox, what was the, uh, was he was, uh, had his own, sh he had a date. Yeah, five, was it Live at Five, right? Yeah, he, I live met him a couple of times. I met him at the Friars, I met him, right. um, and um, he's a really nice guy, very easy to talk to, very, just, you know, genuine guy. And really I I genuine him. and curious and a real fan of this whole era. Yeah, oh, totally. You, you know, he's, he's right up there with Davi and all those guys. Right, exactly. All life is about this lifestyle. There's a lot of fanboys around this era, yeah. Yeah, they know, they're like, you know, just so incredibly, uh, their lives are so affected by Dean, uh, Frank Sinatra. It's like, that's their son, you know, and they just- Right, exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then TCM? Is your it's on TCM uh, Friday, uh, November 19th at 8 p.m. And then it and then it's followed by the caddy and Rio Bravo in a double feature, which is really cool. Uh, and then the following week, it's on again at twelve thirty in the morning with two movies preceding it: Robin in the Seven Hoods and Ocean's Eleven. 
So right. two Fridays in a row, it's going to be a really fun, two fun nights on TCM. You're going to be on, are you, is that interview with Ben Manquitz, you're going to be on TCM introducing it? Yeah, I'll be on, I should be on both weeks, but uh, he also interviewed us for me and my producing partner, Alon Arboleda for uh, the Caddy and Rio Bravo as well. So we talk about both in the intro and outro. Mm, great. Well, thank you. This has been fantastic. I know you have a dinner in a little bit. Yeah, no worries. Um, it was nice Thanks, to see you again. And uh, I was glad for the opportunity to see it. Dean Martin, King of Cool. Yeah, and I'll, I'll come visit whenever I'm up there visiting my brother who lives in oh, uh, yeah. Hyde I'll, Park. Uh, oh, he's in Hyde Park. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, or I can come down. Let me know. I, I'm. Uh, well, not, no, not Hyde Park, Forest Park. Where's that? It's uh, you know, the bridge going to Kingston is at 199, the Rhinecliff yeah. Bridge. It's yeah. literally you get off the bridge on the Rhinebeck side and you keep going straight into a development. Oh, oh, so the, yeah, that's right. There's a gas station right there. Yeah. So in that yeah. development, I don't know exactly where, but nor do I want to say it. But <laughs> no, no, oh, I, I think I know exactly where you're talking about. Uh, yeah. anyway, I'm right. Yeah, I'm just minutes from there, I guess. And then, um, yeah, we'll totally do it. I'll, I'll uh, text you my um my number i'll just you know i don't know if you cool. have it but i'll text you that number on on uh facebook um all right great this is cool fun thank you thank you so much adam you're welcome good luck with welcome. Uh, the premiere thank you i appreciate it Bye. okay